Gather round now, my masters, hear and attend. Our two fine young lives were here brought to an end. By bearing false witness with malice and fight, their neighbors dispatched them to infinite night. George and Jane Berkshire, a horrible pair, to get rid of a lodger they'd crookedly swear. They sought for a keyhole such while goings on, and playing around by Jimmy and John. They saw through the keyhole. They saw through the keyhole. They saw through the keyhole. Their vile goings on. Now Jimmy and Johnny walked ale at him. When Johnny saw Jimmy, his thoughts turned to thin. And since Jimmy was warm and had drunk quite a few, he went back with Johnny to a house that he knew. Old William had run there, was happy to rent our two men who on this jet were Though the house owner's agents were filled with chagrin, the sight of the boys that old William brought in. They swore through the keyhole, they swore through the keyhole, who William brought in. This is where it all happened. 45 George Street. It was renamed Dolben Street after the First World War, and this is not the original house. But the previous house was where James Pratt and John Smith were arrested. Forty years previously, pioneering feminist Mary Wollstonecraft also lived here. Clearly a house of transgression. Wollstonecraft said, it is justice, not charity, that is wanting in the world. Now, the three houses to the right are original Georgian, so 45 George Street would have looked much like that. The street would have been much narrower, and there would have been similar houses on the other side, so there would have been no light, and the stench would have been unbelievable. Now, at the back of the house, a courtyard with stables on one side with rooms over the top, uh, which would look into the rooms opposite. Now, you can see where the entrance to the courtyard would have been. There's now a garage. It's that white door, if you can see on the far left side of the slide there. And in one of the rooms above on the first floor lived a man called William Bonnell. Spare a thought for an old man. I'm 68. Not too good on my legs these days. By rights, I should have died years ago. Can't work. Got no family. And there wasn't no pension back then. Oh. What was I to do? <laughs> well, thank for the Lord for the lusts of young men, say I. Young men such as James Pratt, aged 30, with his wife Elizabeth some 10 years older, and two kids aged 10 and 8. The scene, Giffen Street, just off Deptford High Street, along the river, about four and a half miles. Oh, come on, Liz. I'm your husband. You owe me a duty. You're my wife. No, James, please. The children might wake. Let them wake. They've seen the dogs going at it. It won't be a surprise if they seize us. No. Don't you want it? Don't you like it no more? It's not that. I love you and honour you. You're my husband. But I'm scared. What if I get with child again? We lost one but six months ago. It near killed me. 
I'm too old to bear children more, James. Think not of yourself. Think of me. Oh. Besides, you have to be up betimes. You said you'd go for a position as a groom up Southwark Way. It's been weeks since you had work. Perhaps they'll be hiring. You're right, wife. You're right. <sighs> so, it's the 29th of August, 1835. The end of a very long, hot and dry summer. The air of the city is particularly foul this year with the heat. Off goes James the next morning, walking from Deptford to Blackfriars. But he takes his time and he stops off for a drink or two on the way. Fanny Cronin, neighbour. I've known Pratt for nine years. He's a married man with a family. He was living with his wife and children at the time this happened and he dined with me between one and two o'clock that day. I wished him to stop to tea but he said no. He must be home by six o'clock, but he was going to seek after a weekly situation. He had been drinking that day. We had two pots of half and half at my house, and he appeared a little affected with liquor. We don't know where else he stopped, but my guess is that one place, the last place, was the George, the great coaching inn, whence Chaucer's pilgrims set off to Canterbury on what is now Borough High Street. This is not a time, 1835, when there were anything like gay bars, but homosexual activity was everywhere, with men routinely sharing a bed, and largely beyond the reach of Sir Robert Peel's new constables, the hated Peelers. Any gay man of a certain age will tell you that a right place for cruising in any town is always the bus station. New arrivals all the time, new blood. A coaching inn was the 19th century equivalent of the bus station. But before we carry on with our story, uh, we need to prepare an experiment. Uh, my glamorous assistant uh, has prepared- That's me. Peter here, my glamorous assistant, has prepared some rather disgusting porridge. Hang on a moment, bear with me. Don't, we don't wanna hurry this. Right. This is uh, our Blue Peter moment coming up. our Blue Peter moment. Yes, don't try this at home. Are you Peter Perth or Valerie Singleton at this moment? I, oh, in my dreams. Right, there we are. There's some lovely, 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 lovely. Oh, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Oh, God. It's... I've heard that before. Oh, ah! I don't know if you can see that, can you? Yummy. There you go. Oh, lovely. So the time is up. Well, the significance of this will become clear later on. Uh, bear with us. Back to the Georgian. What do you have, friend? John Smith, 40. Not married. A loner. Cannot read or write. Lives with his elderly mother. Let us say a regular at the George. Oh, me? Yes, you, brother. You look like a man in need of a drink. Oh, oh I don't know as to that. Seems like I've sucked a few today already. <laughs> but I'm sure there's room for one more. Landlord? <clears throat> What's your name? Uh, James. And I am John. Are you married, friend James? <laughs> am I married? <laughs> John, I am trebly tied and bound in marriage. Huh. How's that, James? Once to my lovely wife, Elizabeth. Once to my little girl, also Elizabeth. And once to my son, William. That's three times bound. But, but don't mistake me, I do love my wife. Oh, I'm sure you do. But sometimes you feel that you want to kick against the pricks. <laughs> pricks. <laughs> pricks. <laughs> Your wife is told. 
Oh, what? I love my wife, for sure. But she's feared of relations between us ever since she miscarried. And I'm only flesh and blood. You're a man, James. We are both men. Drink up. Yeah, you could, um, you could still have some fun, you know? <laughs> what? Oh, no. I, I could never lie with another woman. I wasn't talking about another woman. Don't tell me you've never done it. I can tell by your look. When I was younger, before I married. I knew it. I can always tell. What say you then? Oh, I don't know. You are a fine, handsome fellow. Shame to waste it. Ah, James, this is my friend William. He lodges not far from here in George Street, a private room alone. That's right. I like to offer the use of my room to young men in need of somewhere retired, young men in search of fun if you catch my meaning. You'd like that, James, wouldn't you? I'm so close. <laughs> Don't say you never think of that. I can see you're hard already. Just a bit of fun, right? In private, right? And no one else need know. Exactly. I do this all the time. My landlords never complain. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go back first and make the room all cosy. You follow in 10 minutes or so. I'll leave the door open for you. And are, are you sure the landlord won't mind? Oh, James, I've been here scores of times. It'll be fine with him. I swear. <laughs> So Jimmy and Johnny were both of good cheer, while William out for to buy them some beer. They lay down, James put his leg in the air. At least that's what both of them did. Well, Parkshire climbed up to where she could see. Jimmy was sitting on young Johnny's knee. Her husband and she used the keyhole and swore they saw the two men in love on the floor. They saw through the keyhole. They saw through the keyhole. They saw through the keyhole the men on the floor. Landlords George and Jane Berkshire. He 49, she 10 years younger. They run a coal business from their backyard and rent out horses. Look, here he comes again, the old villain. Who's he brought back this time? Uh, nobody I can see. Nobody yet. I'll lay you a shilling, there'll be men on the doorstep within the hour. I know his ways. How many has he brought back this week? Let me see. It's Saturday. He had one on St. Bartholomew's Day. One couple on Tuesday. Two couples Wednesday. Oh, the noise the second lot made. Then the man came back from Monday on Thursday and brought someone else with him. Bold as brass. I'll tell you, this has to stop. This ass is getting a reputation as a disorderly ass. We scarce can sell our coal more for the shame. And what about the other lodgers? They have children. What kind of an example is it to set? What did I tell you? It's him again. What do you want? Uh, does Mr William Bonnell lodge here. He knows damn well he does. He does, but I believe he is not at home. Pardon me, I believe he is, for I saw him at the window. Quick, husband, go up to the room over the stable, it's opposite Bonnell's. See what you can see. 
And while they were preparing to be peeping Toms, James, all unsuspecting, sneaked into the house after John. The Old Bailey. The jurors for our Lord the King upon their oath present that John Smith, late of the parish of Christ Church in the county of Surrey and within the jurisdiction of the said court, labourer. And the jurors have said upon their oath have said do further present that the said James Pratt, late of the parish of Christ Church, have said in the county of Surrey, have said and within the jurisdiction of the said court, labourer. Not having the fear of God before his eyes, nor regarding the order of nature, but being moved and seduced by the instigation of the devil on the 29th day of August in the sixth year of the reign of our sovereign Lord William IV, by the grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Feloniously, wickedly, diabolically, and against the order of nature, had a venereal affair with one James Pratt, and did then and there feloniously, wickedly, diabolically, and against the order of nature, carnally know the said John Smith, and with him the said James Pratt, did then and there feloniously, wickedly, diabolically, and against the order of nature, commit and perpetrate the detestable, horrid, and abominable crime, among Christians not to be named, called buggery, to the great displeasure of Almighty God, to the great scandal of all humankind, against the peace of our Lord, the King, his crown, and dignity. And the jurors aforesaid upon their oath aforesaid do also hereby further present that William Bonnell heinously maliciously did incite, move, procure, counsel, hire and command the said John Smith and James Platt the feral felony aforesaid in the manner and form aforesaid to do and commit against the form of the statute in such case made and provided and against the peace of our court and the peace of our said Lord the King, his crown and dignity. And no one speaks up now for Jimmy or John. For less than an hour, all their prospects are gone. But away to the prison at Newgate they led, with the sentence to hang by the neck until death. All of their neighbours, for mercy to plead, for James Pratt, the labourer, is well liked indeed. His wife to petitions, for pity she cried, the bark shells ruined with lies. They made up the keyhole, they made up the keyhole, they made up the keyhole, their tissue of lies. Ensley Wedgwood, Prosecuting Counsel. Mr. Berkshire, what did you do? I went out to the back premises of my place. There was a loft over the stable right opposite Bonnell's window. I moved a tile and had a very good sight of his room. And what did you see? I saw Bonnell sitting on one side of the window and Smith on the other, looking out of the window and talking together. And after a few minutes, I saw Pratt come and put himself down on Bonnell's knee. Sitting on his knee? Yes, it was but a short time. He then rose up as if pushed by Smith. I then shifted myself as I was rather cramped. And when I turned my head, Pratt was away. I saw Bonnie and Smith sitting at the window. They seemed to be laughing together and in conversation. I then went indoors. Wife, come see. We got that Bonnie red-handed in his filthy trade. Yes? Yes, indeed. If this don't put a stop to his tricks, I don't know what will. What happened? Well, see for yourself. Come upstairs with me. No, have your tea first. It's all ready. It's a bit of a mystery why, if they were so anxious to get rid of their disreputable lodger, they took time out to have their tea when such an opportunity presented. While he's having his tea, Jane goes and has a peek for herself. George, finish your tea. Come quickly. You'll not believe it. Look there. I looked through the keyhole of the door and I saw Pratt laying on his back with his trousers below his knees and with his body curled up, his knees were up, Smith was upon him. Pratt's knees were nearly up to Smith's shoulders. Smith's clothes were below his knees. I put my shoulder against the door and burst it open. Oh my lord! Well, stop them! Ow! 
break the door down! Right. You saw Pratt on his back, Smith lying on him, and both their trousers down. Yes. Did you see any motion take place? Yes. The motion of the body and a great deal of fondness and kissing. What kind of motion? Well, the motion we might make. Supposing it had been connection between man and woman. Yes, exactly the same. I put my shoulder against the door and burst the catch off the latch from the door, opened it and saw Pratt and Smith. Pratt said, Oh my God, we are caught. Or oh, caught at last, I will not swear which. They changed their position. They did, as quick as possible. Smith got up upon his knees. I saw his private parts as he was getting up. In what state were they? Well, I cannot say, but I saw them. At the moment of your bursting the door, was Smith laying on Pratt? Yes. In the posture you have described? Yes. When Smith got off his knees, Pratt turned himself round on his right side. I did not see his person. Both their trousers were down then. As soon as Pratt got up, he exclaimed very bitterly to me for mercy. They pulled their clothes up as quick as they could and both fell on their knees, offering me their purses and begged hard for me to let them go. What more passed? Oh, Bonnell returned. What the devil? What are you doing here? Cannot a man call a room his own? You old villain. You know what's the matter. You've been practising this in my place for some time past. I know nothing of what is done in my place. I have been absent. Oh, have a drink and be done with it. <laughs> the devil I will. I would not drink in any such society. You will wait here while my lodger and my wife keep an eye on you. I went to the station house for a policeman myself. And why, you may ask, did they meekly wait for the policeman to turn up if they had committed a capital crime? Mr Bodkin, for the defence. Their keyhole of the door, I suppose, was the ordinary height from the ground. Yes, the key was not in it. It is a small room. How near to the door were the men when you saw them? Mm, about six feet. You would look across the narrowest part of the room, would you not? I should rather think it was. It is not quite a square room. It is all but the fireplace. Hmm. How wide is the room there, do you think? I suppose ten feet square. If it had been square, but the fireplace takes a square off, see? They were rather nearer the door than the middle. Then they would not be six feet from the door. Well, I cannot positively say. I rather think that they were nearer the door than the middle. Looking through the keyhole, you would look in a slanting direction? No, I looked across their persons. You could not see the floor close to the door through the keyhole? Within a foot or two, I could. There was a bedstead, some tables, and a chair or two in the room. Was there any furniture between the door and the place you saw them in? No, only the carpet. It is a turned up bedstead and their heads were up against it. They were on the floor. You burst the door. Did you find it fastened? I did not try that. But you might have opened the latch with the handle outside. Yes, I could. <laughs> Whatever the men might have been about, your sudden opening of the door interrupted them, and they got up. Yes. All oh, Jane Berkshire. Did you go up to Bonnell's room? To the door? Did you look through the keyhole? Yes, I did. And what did you see? I saw one man undo his trousers. What then? He lay down on the floor. And what did the other do? He undid his trousers and laid down. What posture did the one lay in who laid down first? He laid on his back. And his trousers were down? Yes. 
How did the other lay down? He laid down on him. Was his face towards him or his back? His face was towards him. Did you see the naked person of either? Both of them! The man that laid down on the top of the other, did you see his private parts? I did. In what state were they? Were his private parts laying down or in a state of erection? Were his private parts in a state for connection? Yes, my lord. You saw them lay down, one on the other? Yes. What next did you see? I only saw their bodies in movement. What do you mean by being in motion? They were moving. Do you mean... Such motion as would take place in connection between a man and a woman? Yes. The man who was laying undermost, did you see in what state his knees were? His knees were up. From what you saw of the posture in which they were, and the motion which took place, you believe took place between them? There was every appearance of a connection between them. Had your husband told you the nature of the feelings he had observed? Yes. And you thought it a fit thing to see for a modest woman? Well, I wish to see if there was anything wrong or no. I suppose when you did look, you did not wait a moment. No, I did not wait long. Not a minute. Hmm. And when you said there was every appearance of a criminal connection between them, did you mean the posture they were in and the motion of the body? Yes. George ran for a peeler called Bob Valentine and told him, come quick, to your lodgings of mine. You'll see two fine crimps that will have found to write a dastardly pair of those damned Solomites. Bob took them, he charged them, they went for the beak, up to the bay, the very next week, where George and Jane Barcher their stories did tell. God saved their souls from the brimstone of hell. They swore on the table, they swore on the table, they swore on the table. Call Constable Robert Howard Valentine. George went to the nearest police station. The station was in Union Street, less than a block away. Three minutes at most. Were you fetched on this occasion by Mr. Barcher? Yes. I took the prisoners into custody. I examined the linen of Smith and Pratt. I found the linen of Smith in a very dirty state in front. The back of his linen was clean. What kind of dirty do you mean? It appeared to me dirt from the fundament. I asked Smith the cause of the dirt being on his shirt. He said he had had a bad disorder, which was the cause of it. Was it the appearance of excrement or disease? Excrement. I said, a surgeon will prove whether it's that or not. And then he said he had not the pox. Now, the front of Platt's shirt was clean, but the back was in a very foul state. It appeared a different matter from Smith's, of a sort of slimy, glutinous nature, and rather yellow. Did it resemble the seed of a man? Yes, my lord. I asked him the cause of his shirt being so dirty. He said he had been bad in the bowels. Was it in a wet 
or dry state? In a wet state. It appeared to be recently done. I took them all three into custody. Bonnell's linen was clean. What you saw on Pratt's shirt was in a wet state? Yes. Hmm. And what you saw on Smith's was not so? It was a different substance. Was it dry? Appeared dry. Was his shirt on when you examined it? Yes. Uh, was this on the lower part of Smith's flap? The inside of Smith's shirt was dirty. But was it on the lower part of the flap? Yes. The bottom part of the flap. <laughs> Order! Order! I am not guilty! I am innocent of the charge! I am quite innocent. When Smith had no voice to protest at his wife, nor he nor his mother knew to read or to write. But nearly a petition proclaimed his shame, the crime against nature too awful to name. The king spared who stole, he spared who blew, for the mites case from his view, and seven days later they were dragged from their cell, while the prison bell sounded the ominous bell. And that's it. No defence, no cross-examination, no testing of the evidence. But we can test the evidence. Let's start with the policeman. He said that Smith had shit on the front of his shirt, which was dry, and that Pratt had semen, or something, on the back of his shirt, which was wet. If Smith had shit on the front of his shirt, there would surely be shit also on the back of Pratt's shirt. And if it was dry, it would have had to have dried in the period between the two men springing apart when George burst in and the arrival of the constable from less than a couple of hundred yards away, somewhere between five and 10 minutes. Now, we set our own homemade shit to dry some 20 minutes ago. My glamorous assistant, Peter, here, uh, will see if it has dried. There you can see it is. And, you know, you can see it's still absolutely, well, pretty wet there. Hasn't had a chance to dry at all. Absolutely delicious. In an age when cholera and dysentery are rife and personal hygiene not of the best, there are obvious alternative explanations. And then there's the keyhole. Let's try and reconstruct the events. Imagine that your eye, uh, your camera, is eye seeing through the keyhole. George claimed that he could see through the keyhole. There was a bedstead, some tables and a chair or two in the room. Hmm. Hmm. If you look at your own camera and what it sees, the line of vision is very limited and the closer anything is to the camera, the less you can see. I saw one man undo his trousers and lay down. I saw the other undid his trousers and laid down on top of him. Hmm. And what else did she see? I saw their bodies of movement. The lower one had his knees up. Hmm. Hmm. They're on the floor, remember? Not more than three feet away. I did not wait long. Not a minute. Less than a minute 
is meant to be long enough to see the two men undoing their trousers, lying on top of each other. Oh yes, and somehow she saw the private parts of both of them and in a state to make connection. Pratt has his legs up level with Smith's shoulders and then there is George. I saw Pratt on his back, Smith lying on him and both their trousers, Dan. Did you see any motion take place? Yes! The motion of the body and a great deal of fondness and kissing. Hmm. Jane saw no fondness and kissing, but let's assume they started it immediately after for George's benefit. Kissing is out of the question. If your trousers are around your ankles and your legs in the air, the trousers get in the way. Go on, try it. No, don't try it, because you might get carried away. We'd rather you saw the rest of the play. Now, both of the men are stoutish, unlike uh, the lads in our cast here. Uh, now, if John Smith is using his hands for fondling, James is going to be taking the whole weight of a fat man on his legs. And all in complete silence because neither George nor Jane mentions any noise at all. Now, how much of that can you see through the keyhole? Let's test it. Yeah, the camera can act as a keyhole because its vision is limited in the same way. This action is meant to be happening close. They would not be six feet from the door. Now, who in the cast can get into that position on the floor? Yeah, I can. Ah, oh, our lovely, glamorous Alex. Okay. Character witnesses. Thank you, Alex. My husband is a car man. I've known Pratt nine years. He's a married man with his family. He bore a very good character for morality, decency, and everything that is good. He always bore a most excellent character in all of his situations, in every respect. I am a drayman. I knew Pratt well. I've not known him much about, I've not known much about him since I left Camberwell, but I heard of him frequently. He bore a very good character for decency of conduct during the whole time I knew him. I always found him decent in conversation. I have known Pratt nine years down to the present time. He bore the character of a decent, well-conducted, moral man. I, I always thought so. He was everything to the contrary of what I have come about. Uh, I've been acquainted with Pratt upwards of two years. He bore a very good character. He was very decent in conversation and always conducted himself very gentlemanly. My husband is a sailor and lives at number 27 Gibson Street, Deptford. I've known Pratt for 10 years to the present time. I've lodged in the house with them for the last year and a half. I was lodging there when he was taken into custody. He always bore a very good character. And when my husband came home from sea and I was in confinement, he slept with my husband. And my little girl is now five years old. The prisoner's wife attended me and nursed me. My husband is a ship corker. We lived in Gibson Street, Deptford at 27, in the same house I have lived these seven years. The prisoner Pratt bore good character for decency and morality in every respect. During the time I have known him, I have never heard anything amiss. Smith, guilty, death. Pratt, guilty, death. Bonhill, guilty. Transported for 14 years. Which is the same as death for a man of 68. Apart from Smith and Pratt, Gurney sentenced eight people to death that day. Three were aged 15, one 16, 117, 119, 121 and 132. 
They were dragged away to Newgate to await execution. The trial took roughly one hour. There was no appeal process except to petition the King for mercy. Appeals went through the Home Secretary, Lord John Russell. Honoured sir, I am sentenced to death and only now wait His Majesty's pleasure. But as a dying man, I solemnly protest my innocence, uh, uh, at the same time imploring your, your kind assistance in, in my dying hours, which are but few. I hope, so. you will use all your efforts to help a persecuted man whose life has been falsely, so falsely sworn away and deny, de delay no time uh, as it is getting very short. The humble prayers of the wife of James Pratt, now a prisoner, that your petitioner's husband had lived in the capacities of groom and footman in several gentlemen's families of the highest respectability, during which time his moral character was unimpeached, he never having in the course of his life before rendered answerable to a court of justice. Most humbly and earnestly beg your lordship will take his lamentable case into your humane consideration and intercede for a mitigation of his awful sentence. I have known James Pratt and his wife these 15 years, and up to his being taken into custody, he always bore the most unexceptionable character and has always been respected by his neighbours and friends. That was George Parker, whose petition collected 52 signatures locally in Deptford and Greenwich. But even the perjured witnesses whose evidence hanged the two came forward to plead for him. George and Jane Berkshire. To the Right Honourable Viscount Melbourne, humbly on treat that the said James Pratt, who is in Newgate under sentence of death, up to the period of his apprehension, he was living in credit and supporting his wife and family at Deptford, and his moral character was never impeached. Your petitioners plead the former good character of the said James Pratt. And humbly pray that your lordship will be pleased to recommend that the royal clemency may be extended and his life be spared. Your petitioners will ever pray. Even the prosecutor. I feel so strongly that death is not the punishment for their offence. And the dreadful situation they're in shocks me so much that I cannot neglect a chance of saving them. Surely, my lord, it is not a crime against society of such a description as to call for the spilling of blood. That punishment should be reserved for terrifying crimes, for those offering violence. There is a shocking inequality in the law upon the rich and poor. It is the only crime where there is no injury done to any individual, and in consequence it requires a very small expense to commit it in so private a manner, and to take such precautions as to render conviction impossible. It is also the only capital crime that is committed by rich men but they are never charged. The detection of these degraded creatures was owing entirely to their poverty. They were unable to pay for privacy. I earnestly hope that your Lordship will find it possible to spare their lives. H. Wedgwood. The petitions never reached William IV because the Prime Minister decided that the sentences should stand. Charles Dickens visited Newgate the night before John and James were to hang. It is a long sombre room with two windows sunk into the stone wall and here the wretched men are pinioned on the morning of their execution before moving towards the scaffold. They had nothing to expect from the mercy of the crown. Their doom was sealed. No clue could be urged in extenuation of their crime. And they well know that for them, there was no hope in the world. The two short ones 
the tone he whispered, were dead men. The light fell upon one of them and communicated to his pale, haggard face and disordered hair, an appearance which at that distance was ghastly. His eyes wildly staring before him. He seemed to be unconsciously intent on counting the chinks in the opposite wall. They were as motionless as statues. <laughs> Hundreds were gathered and hissed and they booed, while James shook with fear beneath the noose as he stood. Papers all said it was over ere long, and nobody spoke the way things went wrong. The hangman had weighed both the men in the clink. His measures were out, as he could drink. The struggle, the kicking, the fighting for breath. A minute, an age, twixt the drop. And the death. Because of the keyhole. Because of the keyhole, because of the keyhole, they're sent to the death. The Morning Post, Saturday, November 28th, 1835. The sheriffs arrived at Newgate about half past seven o'clock yesterday morning. Both culprits appeared in a very weak state, and when eight o'clock arrived, the hour of execution, it was found almost necessary to carry them from their cells. Pratt especially appeared dreadfully weak and dejected, while Smith was being pinioned. Pratt appeared to suffer dreadfully. His groans sounded through the prison, and he repeatedly exclaimed, Oh God, this is horrible! This is indeed horrible! He, at this time, was so weak that the executioner's assistants found it necessary to hold him in their arms to prevent him from falling to the ground. All the preparations having been completed, the melancholy uh, procession proceeded to the scaffold. Smith was the first to ascend the scaffold, and immediately after, Pratt was assisted up the steps and placed under a beam. They were received with groans and hisses, which lasted the whole time the hangman was making the necessary preparation. The preparations were not exactly scientific, especially if the hangman was drunk. William Colcroft hanged Pratt and Smith, and he was often drunk. In his 45-year career, he hanged 450 people, for which he was paid a guinea a week, uh, plus one guinea per execution. He supplemented his income by selling the hanging rope afterwards to the spectators, at the rate of five shillings per inch. Uh, he always used a short drop, unlike the executioner in Dublin. Proceedings of the Capital Sentences Committee, a commission of inquiry into the best way to execute prisoners instituted by Parliament in 1888. We dissected the body of the hanged man and were greatly shocked to find that the man's head had been nearly cut off. My impression was that a few inches more would have cut off the man's head. It was the last execution which took place in public in Dublin. The next execution was the first in private. The head was taken off. I found that the rope used in the first execution was much more elastic. The stiffness of the second rope acted like a wire and cut off the man's head. In England, by contrast to the Irish long drop, a short drop, seldom exceeding two feet, was the usual practice. The short drop means death by asphyxia. In the case of an execution with a short drop, the criminal becomes unconscious between one and three minutes. 
as in the case of drowning, but automatic convulsions lasting for many minutes was set up in the body and shot the spectator. I believe you are chief warder at Newgate. Yes, I've been in the prison altogether some 20 years. Has it been your duty to attend executions? Yes, during the whole of that time. During that time, have there been any failures in the satisfactory performance of the executions? The first case was a man named Harris. The whole front of his throat tore right away. For the first six or seven years I was in the prison, Calcroft was the executioner and the men did not die so instantaneously as they do now because he used a shorter drop altogether. Calcroft's custom was not to give more than two feet, two or two feet, six inches. I never saw one of his more than three feet. What usually happened so far as you could judge by the eye? Mm, the culprit was strangled. And I saw twitching for seven or eight minutes in this position. The shoulders, hands and arms moved for six, seven or eight minutes. Were the twitchings more violent at first? Oh, yes. For the first few seconds. Then they gradually left off till one just saw the hands move in that way. I was served into the jail of Newgate from 1855 to 1882. Nearly 27 years. I've witnessed 40 executions. Calcraft's career reached up to 1874. The first execution I saw in 1856, there was an accident. Up to that time, the legs were not tied together, they were free. The prisoner was placed on a high office stool and this stool was placed on the platform. When the prisoner was thrown off, Feeling he was going, he made a sort of movement with his feet against this stool. The effect was to produce a sort of pendulous movement, and he got his feet onto the edge of the platform. He was immediately thrown off, and he got his feet again against the opposite edge of the platform. He was thrown off from that, and he got his feet a third time on the edge of the platform. Then Calcraft, who was down below, seized his legs, and the execution. He liked to pull on the legs or stand on the shoulders of the victim in an effort to break his or her neck. He liked to give a good show to the crowd. I am William Cart, MB, surgeon in the 2nd Battalion Coldstream Guards. Have you witnessed deaths by strangulation? Yes, I have, that is to say from asphyxia. In those cases, were the sufferings of the culprit prolonged? Not to any great extent. I've seen men struggling for five minutes. Can you form any opinion as to the proportion of those five minutes during which they were conscious of pain? I do not believe that they were acutely conscious of pain for more than a minute and a half. But a minute and a half is a very long time under such circumstances. A minute and a half of concentrated agony is, of course, a very long time. They usually struggle violently for the first minute and a half or so, and then there would be a period of about a minute or two during which they do not struggle at all. A minute and a half of concentrated agony for John Smith and James Pratt. Let's uh, test out what that would have been like, shall we? Ready, steady, go.
And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how long it took to dispatch John Smith and James Pratt to Infinite Night. Are we having fun yet? <laughs> The quick line, easy, martyrs away, and nobody knows where the bones lie today. But here we see the and here we remember, 1835-27. Member. The keyhole. Remember the keyhole. Remember the keyhole. Remember. Remember. And the role of martyrs goes on. These are victims since 1990. Dr. Nazim Mahmood. 34, London, jumped off a balcony and killed himself because his mother wanted him cured of his homosexuality. 30th July, 2014. Remember! Dylan Kirby, 12 years old, London, hanged himself after a long period of homophobic abuse. Social services missed the signs. 16th February, 2010. Remember. Three dead, 81 injured in the Admiral Duncan pub, Soho, London, killed by a nail bomb, 30th of April, 1999. Remember. Jody Dubrovsky, 24, Clapham, London, kicked and stamped on as if trying to kill an animal, 14th of October, 2008. Remember. Michael Corser, 18 years old, Manchester. You little queer faggot, the attacker shouted as he kicked his head in and killed him. 25th July, 2008. Remember. Ian Baham, 62, Trafalgar Square, London. Attacked and kicked to death. 25th of September, 2009. Remember. Jerry Edwards, 59. Bickley, London, stabbed to death in his home, 3rd of March, 2009. Remember. Stuart Walker, 28, Cumnock, Ayrshire, Scotland, choked to death, then burned, 24th October, 20. Remember. Anthony Walgate, Gabriel Covery, Daniel Whitworth, Jack Taylor, Barking, East London and possibly 58 others. Poisoned by Stephen Port, a serial killer they met through the internet, June 2014 through to September 2015. Remember. PC Gordon Semple, 59, South London, strangled by sex partner Stefano Brizzi. Brizzi chopped the body up and tried to dissolve it in acid. 13th of April, 2016. Remember. Yup, Camp. 52, Florist, New Cross, London. Knifed in a homophobic murder which is still unsolved, 4th June, 2000. Remember. Damalola Taylor, age 10, Peckham, London. Subjected to homophobic bullying at school, stabbed and died, 27th November, 2000. Remember. Emmanuel Spiteri and Andrew Collier, two of the five victims of Colin Ireland, jailed for life in 1993. Remember! Elizabeth Lowe, 14 years old, Manchester. Hanged herself because she could not tell her religious parents she was lesbian. 17th December, 2014. Remember! Robin Brown, 23, a trans prostitute stabbed to death in her flat. 28th February, 1997. Remember. David Morley, 37, manager of the Admiral Duncan. 
murdered by four teenagers, happy son. Remember. October 2004. Remember. Geoffrey Windsor, 57, South Norwood, London, beaten to death with a car aerial in a park, 26th June 2002. Remember. Stephen Simpson, 18, openly gay, autistic, set on fire at his birthday party, June 2012. Remember. Joker, <clears throat> 51, Perth, Scotland, kicked and beaten to death by three youths who boasted about it at a party immediately afterwards, 22nd of April, 2007. Remember. George Brin. Casement. George Brin. George Brin. George Brin. George Brin. George Brin. Andrew Collier. Alan Turing. Roger Casement. Remember. James Mill. Remember. Michael Booth. Drew Griffiths. There were 14,491 hate crimes against LGBT people and 2,333 against transgender people in 2018 to 2019. Remember, the beginning is always today, Mary Wollstonecraft. <laughs>